Good afternoon and welcome to this online seminar. My name is Pierre Schlosser. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. And it is a real pleasure for me to introduce and moderate today's online seminar on banking on bail-in, which will be framed against the background of Too Big to Fail, TBTF in short. By historic standards, bail-in, i.e. the theoretical opposite of bail-out, is a relatively new concept in banking and finance. It has its roots in the recent financial crisis and a given exasperation or even anger with the use of taxpayers' money to save banks. While rather easy to grasp at a conceptual level, the implementation of bail-in is more difficult to get a grip on and notably involves an army of acronyms such as BRD, MREL, TLAC, or even, did you know this one, GLAC, which our speakers of today will be happy to decipher for you. In this context, I'm very, very glad to be in the company of Wilson Irvin, who is Vice President at Credit Suisse and a former Chief Risk Officer. Thank you, Wilson, for making yourself available at such an early New York hour. Our discussions of today are Patrick Onwan, former governor of the Central Bank of Ireland and now at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and at Trinity College Dublin. And Stefano Capiello, previously at the Sing Resolution Board and the European Banking Authority and now Deputy Director of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. Wilson, Patrick, Stefano, many thanks to all of you for being with us today. To save some time, I will not give further details about your professional backgrounds. Our participants can have a look at our website where your short bios are available. Okay, before telling you more about our audience, I'd like to spend just a few minutes to inform you about our school's upcoming activities, be it for you or for your colleagues, by the way. Several of you will know by now that the Florence School of Banking and Finance, FBF in short, is a non-national and academic platform, which is part of the European University Institute. The European University Institute is a very distinctive place. It, it is a public, intergovernmental research and education institute which boasts an international community of more than 60 nationalities and delivers postgraduate studies in economics, law, political science and history. A recent program of the European University Institute, the FBF, is a place where various generations meet to discuss and argue about cutting-edge topics of financial stability and macroprudential policies risk management, as well as regulation, supervision, and resolution. Our school has a diversity of policy debate and training activities, meaning that our online seminars are only one of many activities that we run. For example, we just released a few weeks ago our latest ebook. Here it is. As you see, uh, we also have some printed copies. It looks at institutions and the crisis and gathers contributions from senior policymakers, private practitioners, and academics, and can be downloaded for free on our website. On the training side of things, you can see on the slide that our school has been training more than 1,600 participants coming from more than 65 countries and a variety of institutional backgrounds since its creation. Those figures will soon change since uh, we'll be hosting two more residential courses over the next months in two weeks on forecasting in economics and finance and in four weeks' time on the law, economics, and practice of banking resolution to stay on topic. Let me also seize this occasion to tell you that our 2019 courses offer is now available on our website, so feel free to have a look at the comprehensive list of 18 courses which we are offering across our four areas. You will see that we'll have courses next year on anti-money laundering, securitization, leverage cycles, non-performing exposures, but also on stress testing, sovereign risk, and MIFID II, amongst others. Right, I guess it's time to thank you for your patience and to introduce you to one another. Since you don't see each other, let me do uh, their presentations. You are around 100 participants connected today, following us from almost everywhere in Europe and from some places in the world. 41 nationalities are represented. We're very glad to count on several participants from the Single Resolution Board, the, the European Central Bank, the European Commission, ABN AMRO, Credit Agricole, and the Central Bank of Ireland, amongst others. Congratulations this time to the Single Resolution Board participants who have won the race today. And of course, welcome to all the other participants from the organizations not listed here. Okay, so, and we have 53% uh, of you are women, 47% are men. You have about 7.1 years of professional experience on average. 
51% of you are trained economists, 26% are lawyers, um, and 30% are trained in business. Lastly, 69% of you have a master's degree, while 22% have a PhD and 9% a bachelor degree. Right, a lot of statistics. Now time to start. Uh, how will our seminar be exactly organized? Wilson, our lead speaker, will guide us through the topic of today for 25 minutes. Uh, Wilson's presentation will be punctuated by a few polls which will appear on your screen and will be presented by Wilson himself. Uh, Wilson, by the way, we invite you to provide some brief comments on the results of the polls right after they've been run. After Wilson's presentation, Patrick first and Stefano secondly will provide their comments. And following this, we'll open the Q&A session where you guys will step in and write your questions or comments in the chat box that will appear in due course at the bottom of your screen. So let me stop here, disappear, and leave the floor to Wilson, who is live for us from Madison Avenue in New York City. Wilson, can I ask you to please connect your camera and mic and to share them with uh, the platform where you're connected, so everything is perfect. The floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you, Pierre, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the moon is still up here in New York, but hopefully it's a little sunnier where you are. Um, I like to, you'll see a number of disaster photos as we go through the slides here. Uh, you'll be happy to know this photo is actually a piece of Hurricane Florence in honor of our hosts, uh, trying to destroy a nice piece of non-financial infrastructure uh, somewhere in South Carolina. We're going to go through a, a bunch of topics pretty quickly today. Uh, as Pierre said, there will be some questions at the end, and we hope to make this interactive. So if we've gone too fast or if we've ridden through the logic of one or another of these topics, uh, please do ask a question so we can make this as interactive as possible. If you step back uh, eight or nine years, 10 years ago we had the, the Lehman failure and probably a good solid year of true panic. It was about nine years ago that we started trying to figure out what should we do to make sure this doesn't happen again. And I took a personal poll interest in terms of what would what were the reforms that somebody thought would be the key to the lock, the most important thing that we could do to make sure a crisis like 08 never happened again. And the list started getting pretty long. Uh, if you look at this, there's a lot of good ideas here. I think some, a few mediocre ones and probably some that we don't want to have. But it's, it looks a bit like a medicine cabinet. Uh, and many of these things were actually put into place. Uh, we wanted the patient to take about every pill we had manufactured. But what is the key to the lock here? What made 2008 different? And I would posit that it is the issue on the lower right. It's the issue of resolution and too big a fail that made 2008 different and more virulent than the crisis of 1998, for example, or the uh, Asian crisis of 97, other crises that we have faced in the last 50 years. Uh, and more importantly, um, people like Mario Draghi and Ben Bernanke also think this was the distinctive element when the center of the financial system began to crumble. So just a quick point on the topic today, which I think is not just one of the, one of the important topics. I think it is the central thing to get right after 2008. We needed a new solution there. But identifying the need for a new solution doesn't necessarily mean you get a solution right out of the bag. So the question is, once you've identified this as a core problem, it had been something that had been on people's radar for 30 years or so, how are you going to solve it? So there have been a number of proposals that emerged uh, around this time, and you would have seen a number of these, and you still see a number of these proposals that are discussed. One of them, which happens more on this side of the ocean than probably in Europe, um, is what I call the back to the 1850s strategy. If you're just tough and hard-nosed, if you let them fail, eventually the system will adapt and you'll have a more resilient system. Uh, this sounds good unless you've read the history of the 1850s where crises and panics uh, punctuated economic growth and uh, I would argue was a much less productive financial system uh, than the one we have today. Some would say, you don't want to get to, resol to resolution. You want to just regulate better. Don't let these banks fail. That's hard to do in a world where humans are not perfect. Uh, and then there are more extreme versions of this that say, if humans aren't perfect, perhaps we should go for narrow banking when banks can only buy sovereign securities or super capitalization ratios as a way to enforce that. But none of those have appeared to be particularly practical. 
Perhaps the most common strategy that people have used over the long haul has been forced merger and acquisition. If you find a big, rich acquirer, uh, you can make a troubled smaller bank uh, safer and put it in safe hands. Uh, this is something that happens every day with the small and mid-sized sector uh, in a number of countries. For example, the US does about 50 of these a year. There are also versions where you try to list the whole banking sector to take on uh, the bad assets or purchase a uh, troubled organization. Uh, the Lehman Consortium that we tried to put together to support a Barclays bid in 2008 was one example. And I'd say Atalanta in, in Italy uh, from a couple years ago uh, is another example. Uh, that's a different version, but sort of the same problem. One of the challenges there is you're not adding any equity to the system. You're simply spreading the problem around to other banks. Uh, and as Lloyd Blankfein said on Lehman Weekend, all of our equity is under attack right now. We have enough equity to maybe support the bad assets of Lehman. Uh, but the market sometime on Tuesday or Wednesday is going to ask, do we have enough to really crack this problem for the long term? Some would go the other way. Instead of pulling the banking system together, they would break up the big banks and say, if the problem is too big to fail, let's make them less big. But it's hard for me to understand that both three and four, which really moves in the opposite direction theoretically, could both be right. Some people look at this list and get disillusioned, and they start to go back to bailouts and say, maybe that wasn't so bad. The other solutions don't look so great. Maybe reconsider the role of government. But I think what most people did when they looked at this list is they said, we need a new tool, something else. And what we designed, with working with many people, both in the US and Europe, was something called bail-in. Many of you know what that is. It's been widely discussed. But let's simplify what it really means. It's not a merger transaction. You're only working with a single party. And you're going to reorganize the liability structure, convert long-term debt into fresh equity. You're going to do it fast, because you need to do that in the financial system. Some would say this is a new one. Some would say it's a radical tool. Um, but actually, all it really does is borrow long-standing corporate bankruptcy techniques, something called Chapter 11 in the US and simply speeds it up and adapts it for banks. I think the implications of this system are profound. What you're doing is you're not trying to spread existing equity to solve a problem. You're actually creating new equity at the point of failure. You're trying to protect the most vulnerable parts of your economy and your financial system and reduce the pressure to runs because you're protecting retail clients and counterparties. Uh, you can avoid fire sale because you're trying to preserve value. And that was an important feedback loop in the crisis. You're not pushing the problem to other banks, as uh, Mr. Blankfein uh, discussed. And you're also not impairing the sovereign credit, which was such a difficult thing in 2008 uh, for many countries. So I think this gives you a new and very powerful tool. It's a simpler tool because you're only using uh, doing this with a single party. I'm not saying it is simple. But doing a single party recapitalization, if you strip away some of the other elements, uh, is a much simpler strategy than some of the other options. So let's go to our second section. How is implementation going so far? And what I'd like to do is to contrast, compare and contrast the US and Europe uh, to get a little bit of a higher level view of this. You look at the US, you've got one single large jurisdiction. It wasn't always so. We only did banking union here in the 1990s. Uh, if you look at the capabilities to do resolutions, um, uh, the FDIC has been around for a long time. They do about 50 resolutions a year on average. Um, people want prefer resolutions to government bailouts here, I think, per perhaps more strongly than Europe. TARP, which was our bailout system in the US, was quite toxic. Uh, and the US system benefits from deep capital markets and, a, and helpful bank structure. We passed Dodd-Frank, or Title II, in 2010. And that gives us good bail-in capabilities in law in the US. In contrast, Europe, uh, if you're going to sum it up in a word, is more complex. You've got a, a much different dance between the federal and member state level. Banking union is not yet done. And I would say the political uh, context around bailouts versus bail-ins is much more complex as you go to different countries. Europe has built important new institutions. Uh, the building out of the SRB, I think, is, uh, is terribly important. Uh, but there are some gaps. Uh, Nicholas Veron 
calls this sometimes half banking union, and important features like EDIS or common deposit insurance are not yet in place. Let's dive into the U.S. example just for a little bit before we spend most of our time on Europe. If you go back to the crisis, you had two main piles of resource that you could use uh, to restore solvency uh, if you're looking at bailouts. Uh, you, uh, the Congress passed uh, the second time a TARP program, which was a troubled asset relief program uh, that invested about a quarter trillion in the big U.S. banks. That was all repaid with a little bit of interest. Um, and in addition to that sum, you had the FDIC, which had significant capabilities, and about $100 billion in their war chest. If you compare that to the private sector recapitalization resources we built with Balin, uh, we now have a little over a trillion dollars at the big eight U.S. banks of something called Gone Concern, TLAC, GLAC. Uh, and that gives you a massive amount of private sector on-call capital. So if you're thinking about the resources, the capabilities of your fire department, this is a huge amount of water to pour on a fire. Gives you enormous capability in the next crisis. So could this actually work in the US? I'm going to share with you uh, two points of view. One uh, from a gentleman named Paul Tucker, who ran the FSB project on resolution. And back in 2013, he thought the U.S. had advanced to the point, partly because of an accident of history that U.S. banks were organized this way, that you could do a bail-in in the United States. It wouldn't be completely smooth, as he says, but in extremis, it could be done now. And that was back in 2013. The Fed and the FDIC at that point were still describing the U.S. bank plans as not credible, uh, but that changed about 18 months ago. Um, they are now, uh, they don't say credible, but they say not not credible, which is about as good as it gets in the U.S. Um, and I think they have smoothed out the road a lot from uh, the fairly rocky path that Paul was talking about before. There are some challenges. Um, the U.S. plans are done under a bankruptcy system, not a regulatory system, the so-called Title I legal requirements, uh, although there is a tremendous amount of regulatory oversight underneath that. I think there's also an interesting challenge in that you can't assume lender of last resort in the United States, so the U.S. banks uh, have to have an early trigger for resolution, and they have to self-fund their liquidity by holding extra HQLA, which is a, an interesting response to a political problem, an interesting response to traditional lender of last resort capabilities. So I'd like to pause at this moment and just go to a poll. I've gone through this very quickly, but if people were, if you were looking at um, the papers tomorrow morning and saw a big U.S. bank in trouble, what would happen? Would creditors absorb losses? Would the government bail them out, or something else? Let's just pause for a moment and get in some votes on that. Okay, we now have a fair number of votes. They're still coming in, but uh, I don't know if you can see it on the screen here, but um, this group is more skeptical than, uh, than either the Fed or uh, Mr. Tucker. Uh, roughly half think that creditors will absorb losses. Uh, about 20% think there'll be a government bailout, and about 36% says who knows. <laughs> so a lot of uh, a lot of skeptics in the uh, deep skepticism category. I would say that from an investor standpoint over here, when we do this poll in the United States, um, within the private sector, you will get a much more heavily skewed distribution towards creditors bearing losses. Um, and I'd say very few people on this side of the ocean think that a government bailout would be possible, given how toxic the politics were around TARP last time. But I'd say this is, uh, in some ways, not a not a surprising result, uh, particularly from a, from the academic and official sectors. Uh, 
Uh, I see a lot more skepticism that it will work in those groups, uh, as well as the media, than I do from people who work on the living wills in banks or from people who invest in, in TLAC. Let's go to Europe. And that's where I want to spend most of our time today. What's been happening in Europe uh, since the crisis? Actually, there has been, although we've been designing bail-in and setting up institutions like the SRB over this period, there actually has been a number of resolutions that have been done over this period. And interestingly, there's been a big shift to private capital over this period uh, that you can see in some of the events here. Every one of these, with the exception of the one I'm about to put up, was driven by private capital, not public bailouts, which I think is a pretty radical change from Europe if you were going to step back 10, 15, 20 years. I'd say one other interesting observation to me is that if I think through the mechanics and the actual approaches used in each of these cases, they were all very different. The amount of consistency uh, was very low. And if I talk about, if we talk to our investors, one of the biggest challenges we have with the investors is um, their ability to invest in TLAC on a predictable basis. Uh, we tend to get about 85% saying um, bail-in in Europe is not predictable. It's not something that makes it easy or transparent to invest. Only about 15% think they really know the rules of the road uh, for when a bank goes into trouble, that they have a good predictability about who will bear losses and how clear that will be. So let's now turn to what we built in Europe, what's been done. I think there's been some terrific ex ante legal preparation. The BRD is now in force. Uh, you've got resolution plans that are developed for most big banks. And importantly, you've got the ability to stay runs on derivatives. You built some uh, very important institutional architecture. Uh, and you've even tested that once in the Banco Popular case. Uh, there are legal challenges underway now to test how well those laws work in practice, but that's a, a, a big milestone to get over. And you also have significant TLAC or MREL issued by many banks. Many GSIBs are over the 20% mark in terms of risk-weighted assets of clean subordinate TLAC. That is my personal test of resource credibility. It would enable you to have a bank that is as dumb as any big GSIB in 2008, absorb those losses top to bottom, and recapitalize. Recapitalize to a strong, say, 10% standard. So to me, that is a, a sort of back-in-the-envelope credibility test. What are the challenges? Well, MREL is in place in a bunch of banks, but it's not in place everywhere. There's a number of EU GSIBs that still lag this 20% rule. Uh, this is not a rule that is enforced by anybody other than uh, those of us on this call. Uh, the actual MREL requirements are being established in, in Europe now. And given the ability to use other classes of security, not necessarily just subordinate securities, but also preferred senior, um, the usable, easily usable resources uh, for some GSIBs is below that mark. There are also challenges for mid-sized banks, uh, particularly whether they have access to the market and whether that TLAC is usable, as we've seen in some cases in Italy. You also have the issues of predictability that I talked about before. These two topics were summed up, I think, very well by Mario Draghi. Uh, this is a comment he made right after Cyprus, which is a very difficult event. He said, a bail-in is not a problem. It's the lack of ex-ante rules and the lack of capital buffers that were the challenge in Cyprus. And I think that's beautifully said. Where do we stand on buffers now? This is a comparison of TLAC for GSIBs around the world that we developed. This is looking at the subordinated portion of TLAC, so not the formal FSB definition, um, but the subordinated slice that you can get from looking at disclosure today. In the US, you've got an average of about 25% of risk-weighted assets. In the UK, it's about 24, 25% there as well. Switzerland and Germany are both in the low 30s. But if we look at the rest of Europe, right now we're at about 18 today for the GSIBs. 
and the new rules are still in flux. We don't know where Europe ultimately is going to end up. That's being developed in Trilog now. So one question that I'm watching very carefully right now is whether the EU will get to a credible standard, whether we get, get to something where the amount of TLAC in place is credible and how this comparison will look when and if we enter the next crisis. I don't think you want to be at the lower end of this range when trouble hits the next time. There are two other things I want to put on the to-do list. Liquidity and lender of last resort. Some people say that's the job of the single resolution fund. Uh, but I have questions about whether that is truly the purpose of it, and the scale is also difficult. Uh, I think right now it's in the mid-20 billion euros. Uh, and that, to my eye, is simply insufficient for liquidity provision. Uh, there are individual banks that used a multiple of that during the crisis. So I'm not sure the SRF is good enough. The ECB clearly has the scale, uh, but it's not clear to me they want that role. I do believe that Europe uh, will respond well in the crisis. I do think that they understand this issue, uh, but I'd be much happier with ex anti clarity on the lender of last resort than the current ambiguity. The last item I want to speak to is ring fencing pressures, and we'll talk about that for a couple of quick pages here. I think the ring fencing pressures, both globally and even inside the EU, are important and significant, and they have a big impact on resolution. Um, the uh, ECB president, Draghi, talked about how important this was for monetary policy. He noted in the US, particularly post-banking union here, that 70% of local economic shops were absorbed by finance, but in the Eurozone, only 25% of a local shock and a member state is absorbed through the financial system. As he said, this is a key reason why our crisis was so protracted and why some countries diverged economically. And I leave all of you to imagine what would be the economic and political ramifications if the financial system in Europe helped countries that were under stress by three times more than they do today. I think that would have huge impacts on a number of countries, both economically and politically. Two other points here that are challenges, that ring fencing makes banks riskier. It hurts, I think, both home and host countries makes them more likely to fail, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And it also makes cross-border mergers more difficult. So this is my list of four big to-dos. It's MRO, it's predictability, it's liquidity, and it's ring fencing. I don't think any one of these is a poison pill where it stands today, and Europe has shown great ability to institutionally adapt. Uh, but they are challenges. So let's go to a poll question. Here, it's a similar poll question as before. Um, what do you think would be the outcome for the next big European event? Do you think private capital absorbs losses? Or do you think their bailout occurs? Or do you think it's still up for grabs? Let's give that a moment. Okay, the votes are coming in here. Um, looks like we're ending up with a pretty similar distribution as last time. Not a big difference between Europe and the US. About half of you think the private sector will absorb the losses. And about a quarter would say there's bailouts, and a quarter would say who knows. Um, so interesting that they are so comparable between the EU and the US. I think some other groups I speak to would think the US is a uh, uh, much more tilted towards private sector solutions than Europe. Uh, but this seems uh, pretty even. Uh, I'd also just mention in contrast to when we, we have an investor poll every year, 90% uh, plump for the top one. That in uh, it, among our investors, the people who invest in banks in Europe, uh, we get a little over 90% typically that say it's their money that's going to be used in the next resolution, uh, not state aid. We go very quickly through a couple of ring fencing issues that I think are relevant to people. Um, as you think about resolution, uh, I think it's a profound change to 
how you regulate banks. It, it sets up a whole different architecture between home jurisdictions, the jurisdiction of the headquarters, and a host who's supervising a subsidiary. To me, the key test of regulation and the whole state involvement in bank supervision is really can you support economic continuity and taxpayer protection all the way through, uh, not just the point of failure, but through resolution. That's your decisive test. You don't want uh, the failure of banks to disrupt either your sovereign finances or economic continuity. If you think about that, that pushes back a whole bunch of questions about how you want to structure banks, what's your target resolution structure, where should you issue your equity and your TLAC, uh, what entities would be bailed in. The world has evolved towards basically two models. One is called multiple point of entry, which is a an archipelago model, if you will, of, and think HSBC, HSBC think Santander, um, a group of uh, deposit-funded local banks, where they want the right, in effect, to walk away. Uh, in general, they have supported subs over time, but they want very much the right to make that on a voluntary basis, not a contractual or obligatory basis. And I think if you're a host of an MPOE bank, it's pretty simple. You you're not obligated to get anything from the home, and I think you should treat uh, your host as a normal bank in your country and demand full local resources, just like it was a normal local bank. Most banks go for something called single point of entry, which is a source of strength model. And the resolution occurs only at the top of the group. And the idea is to flow all the liquidity and capital resources down to subsidiaries, keep those as going concerns, and not have a breakup. As Jay Powell, currently chairman of the US Fed, said, when he first looked at bail-in and resolution, uh, and he had, had encountered some of these situations in previous work at the US Treasury, he thought it was very difficult, but that the single point of entry model was a, quote, classic simplifier that changed his mind. But the question is, once you get to a source of strength model, how should a host regulate things? And right now, I would say we don't know. We are still developing a model for that. Why does ring fencing make bank, banks riskier? I'm going to take you through a very quick model of how to look at this. If you have an integrated bank with four, four branches, and you can move capital among them, let's call that our baseline. We'll call that our integrated bank, and we'll call the risk of failure one. And all those branches are linked together. Now let's say that one country wants to ring fence, and they want to get a better position. They want local capital. A single ring fencer, if they demand their share of local capital, can improve their risk of failure by 70%. They can cut their risk by a third because they still have the parent support and there's still a lot of capital at the parent, but they also have local capital as well. But that's going to make resources leaner for everybody else and their risk of failure starts to rise. And in fact, the price of cutting subsidiary A's risk by uh, by two-thirds is it raises the others, if you look at a Monte Carlo approach, by roughly three times. Now, that's still good for subsidiary A, but what if sub B and sub C retaliate? What if they say, I want the same deal that sub A has? If you get endemic ring fencing, which is, I think, the trajectory we've been on lately, everybody's worse off. The risk of failure for each one of these subs is higher, and this is actually, I think, a low bar. This is model on the assumption that there's not contagion between subs. If you assume that, you can get to significantly higher multiples of risk. So as you trap capital, banks become more brittle, more likely to fail. Uh, this is a classic prisoner's dilemma economic problem that you may have seen uh, in other walks of life, where the incentives of each uh, can produce a tragedy commons for all. Last point on this is you look to ring fencing within the bank union. Europe has worked very hard to build institutions that are EU level, that avoid some of this balkanization issue. But statistics, whether it's consolidated foreign claims on the top or cross-border M&A on the lower right, suggest that cross-border activity in the EU has been falling pretty dramatically. One of the reasons why this is important is this third bullet point here, is that cross-border walls 
impair a key resolution tool. If you think back to last summer, the events in Spain were solved in Spain. The events in Italy were solved in Italy. And we've seen that trend in other places. You don't see so much, so many cross-border solutions. And that's a problem. What if Santander had not bid for Banco Popular? I think it'd been a much more difficult time for the SRB to get to a successful outcome quickly. If you compare that to the post-banking union situation in the US, the US FDIC does about 50 resolutions a year. It's, uh, they have statistically 531 failure events over the last decade. Most of those are solved uh, through uh, mergers, a big bank picking up a troubled small bank. Um, you typically get three to four bidders in each of those. And a huge portion of those are, quote, cross-border, cross-state lines, which if I look back 25 years ago was not possible in the US. Now it is the go-to move for the FDIC. It's, op it's made their life, I think, much simpler and much easier and made the resolution system work much better. So for all these reasons, I think bank union and being mindful of ring fencing is very important. So I'll sum up. Um, by the way, this is a picture of uh, Patrick going to work in 2009 when he took on a very, very difficult job at the Bank of Ireland. Uh, he had to douse that fire and thank him for his hard work doing that. Um, I do think we've made a lot of progress. I don't think we can eliminate all crises. I don't think this is a panacea. In fact, I think eliminating all crises could be dangerous because you would build up more tinder on the forest floors. But I do think that we have develop new tools to deal with systemic crises that are far more destructive. And I think Balin gives you tools that have some very important advantages. We've had rapid global progress. I think most GSIBs now are resolvable. I think 70% could be done right now. Uh, whether it's resourcing, legal framework, or whatever, I think they're ready to go. I'm not saying it'd be fun. There'd be a lot of yelling, a lot of legal stress. But I think we now have a solution for about 70%. Europe has done a lot. They built some key institutions. But I think there are some important to-do lists to make resolution more credible, more likely, and more reliable. So I'd like to close with one last poll, and then we'll go to Patrick. Um, when the people on this call, uh, who all have ringside seats to this, look at the most important issues for Europe, what would, they, what would they say? Is it that MREL needs to be built out a bigger pile of usable subordinate capital? Is it predictability, that it needs clear rules of the road? Is it clear liquidity in lender of last resort? Uh, is it a solution to ring fencing and banking union? Is it political will, which is one I didn't include on, on my slide, but is an option for the poll? Or is it something else? Give this just a quick moment to get in some get in some thoughts. Okay, we're getting probably a critical mass here. And it looks like a pretty good distribution. Looks like we need to work on all of these from the votes on the system. Um, we've got about 20% in terms of MREL, a little less in terms of consistency, similar orders of magnitude for liquidity and ring fencing. Political will comes out quite large. Um, but I guess the good news is at least there's nothing else on the list. There's a very small number that think that we don't have at least um, uh, the issue on the table. Um, I, I didn't want to disclose my vote in advance, but for me, if you have strong MREL, ex ante, a big pile of subordinate capital, I do think that that gives you the muscle, the a heavy amount of water uh, to douse a fire uh, that makes a lot of the other issues easier. So for choice, I probably would have plumped for that. Uh, ahead of some of the others, but I think each one of these things would be important to lean into. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Patrick uh, for some commentary. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, uh, 
I agree with nearly everything, maybe with everything that, that Wilson said. So I'm afraid I'm not going to uh, spend my time disagreeing with him. But I just like to look at some of the big issues from a slightly different perspective. And I'm very interested in the answers given to the last uh, poll, because some of what I'm going to say has to do with issues of political will, as well as the issues of building, building out MREL. So I'd like to touch on four what questions I regard as open questions. First of all, is the concept of bail-in established and politically stable in Europe? So that's the political will question, if you like. And the sort of link to that is, how crucial is bail-in to avoid the bank sovereign doom loop? Is it as important as people make it out to be? And I'll just say a few words about liquidity and resolution. Uh, it, it's something that's worrying a lot of people. And finally, a remark on, would more equity be a better way of building out capital and, 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 uh, well, than bailable debt and bail-in of creditors of, uh, rather than shareholders? So first of all, on the political question, I think the degree of double think still prevails around the issue of, of bail-in and, and, and uh, too big to fail in. It's, and it may be surprising that this group that's, you know, at this seminar sees private creditor bail-in as, uh, as the most likely outcome in Europe. I think um, if, if that question was asked uh, with a further supplement, I think that many of you listening would say, yeah, well, when we said there would be bail-in, probably we had in mind that there would be partial bail-in, but not excluding the use of some public funds. So bail-in of politically um, unimportant, for example, foreign creditors. But that has been, to some extent, the pattern. But the double thing I'm talking about is, you know, on the one hand, yes, there's taxpayer resentment and fear about the cost of bailing out banks. But on the other hand, there certainly is in Europe depositor and investor concern about haircuts on bank liabilities. People want their bank deposits and investments to be safe. But at the same time, they say no bank should be too big to fail. Now, the BRRD has tried to find the ideal balancing solution here. Um, but we've seen the political pushback, both when Bailey has been affected, you know, Cyprus, Slovenia, Portugal, and when it has not been affected, uh, for example, in, in Italy, in Ireland, and in the UK. <clears throat> so. You know, what I, what I think is that, let, let me give you three examples. The repeated mention, also today by Wilson, of the need for an EU mutualized deposit insurance scheme, Aegis, and the repeated call for a greatly enlarged resolution fund. We hear these all the time. Now, just to be clear, I'm in favor of both of these. Europe works better when it's, you know, whole, the whole financial strength, uh, pooled strength, financial strength, and other strength to deal with problems that arise. Europe works better that way. Uh, European finance as an absorber of national shocks, Mario Draghi is right, as, as Wilson quoted. But the, the, the dumb of think is evident in the advocacy of the most strident advocates of, 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 of these two innovations. And Edis. Uh, European Deposit Insurance Fund is nice to have, but I would argue it's of comparatively little importance with dealing, uh, dealing with resolution issues. We've got BRRD. My argument is because we have BRRD and the bail-in possibilities, we don't actually need the European Deposit Insurance Fund for that, for that side of things. MREL and TLAC should be big enough to mean that there would be no call on the Deposit Insurance Fund in resolution cases. Uh, yeah, if the National Deposit Insurance Fund is too small, that could create a problem for liquidation cases, but not for resolution cases. So it makes me think that the strident, the more strident advocates of EDIS uh, that have mentioned it in the context of resolution haven't really bought in to the concept of the RRD bail-in. And, and by the way, none of the European bank failures were caused by retail depositor runs. So removing about the sufficiency of national deposit insurance funds not going to uh, 
help all bank failures. And it's more or less the same story, the pressure for a much larger resolution fund. Now, I don't, Wilson mentioned resolution fund in the concept of, of liquidity in, in, in resolution, but actually the main uh, purpose of, of resolution fund in, in European legislation is there to be there as a kind of backstop for very deep uh, failure situations to or complex failure situations. But I think that most of the people that are now pushing for a rapid increase in the size of the European Resolution Fund are actually not talking about that. They're talking about it not as a supplement to bail in, to deal with these deeper or complex cases, but as a partial alternative to bail in. So that's my perspective on uh, the, the double think that still persists politically in Europe. Now, I'm, I'm taking up too much time. Let me say a couple of words about the doom loop. Often here we all, too big to fail. Uh, why, why is that important? Some people keep on bringing back this question of banks causing governments to fail. And the doom loop has two sides. Government default triggering bank failure, bank failure triggering government debt on sustainability. A bail-in resolution certainly helps to block the bank failure triggering government debt problems side. But the point I want to make is that in practice, there's been a tendency for markets and commentators to overrate the frequency with which bank failures have actually doomed government finances. Yes, in Iceland, it could have doomed it, and in that case, they did bail in, and the Icelandic sovereign came out actually ahead. But severe problems, even such as that in Spain, were easily absorbed by the sovereign. And in the case of Ireland, which the market thought, well, Ireland is finished, they've they, 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 they guaranteed all the bank debt. In the end, the net bailout costs have only contributed about one-sixth of government debt. So actually, the market exaggerated the problem. And I think the degree to which the bank-to-government channel is really a path of doom is, is probably exaggerated. Let's not forget that governments in 16 European countries bailed out their banks. This did distort the public finances. It imposed significant tax burdens, but it did not doom the public finances to collapse. So eliminating too big to fail is good for those reasons of easing the pressure on public finances and improving the incentives in bank management. But let's not exaggerate its role in removing a doom. I only have time to say something very brief on liquidity in, 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 in resolution. Um, it, ELA was an important tool in the crisis. It should not be as necessary now, given the availability of resolution tools. And, and we saw that in the case of Banco Popular. They said, well, okay, forget about ELA. You, we've got resolution. We're going to deal with this. And at the same time, it seems to me important to establish as a principle a resolved bank. To the extent that a resolved bank is a normal bank, it should have access to central bank liquidity as any other bank. And what we need to do is to ensure that this happens smoothly when needed. And that will need a good flow of information and a degree of trust between the central bank, between the ECB and the resolution authority. But this, this needs to uh, be established in a close working relationship so that so the resolution authority knows we have fixed this bank it is resolved. The market may not believe it, but at least the ECB believes it. Then, then, then the problem is solved. And my final point, okay, so available bonds, MREL, TLAC, subordinated debt, preference. Would more equity be better than available bonds? This is a big question that has been flashed over backwards and forwards, and I don't think I have time to go into it. But I just want to remind you that you could get to this sufficient available uh, stuff in if you had more capital. The great advantage in a more equity capital, the great advantage in, in relying on equity rather than these complex or uh, novel instruments is that politicians are not so afraid of seeing shareholders lose money. I'm fearful in a, in a major bank crisis that they will say, the losses to, to bondholders, to large depositors, are 
too politically fraught, we won't do it. So, you know, I, I could imagine in 10 years' time, maybe people will say, those bonds weren't such a good idea. We should have done it by equity. I think I better stop there. I use up all the time. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's move over to Stefano, who has, uh, who has a few slides. And uh, just to say that this will be extending the duration of the, of the online seminar by 15 minutes to keep up. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks to the previous speakers for the thorough presentation and the very stimulating um, remarks by Patrick. Um, also, allow me to start by sending my special greetings to my friends and uh, former colleagues at SRB who have so kindly uh, registered for this seminar. So I'm mindful of time, and I want to uh, pick up only on three uh, very briefly aspects that have been, and I want to touch on them, leaving space for, for questions. Um, the three aspects, uh, let me start. The first one is Open Bank Bellina. Um, presentation by um, Irving has been focused, uh, rightly so, on Open Bank Bellina, on, on Bellina, because this is the uh, most likely tool to be used for, for GSIBs. Now, in Europe, we have a very um, different kind of banks. Uh, the landscape of the banking sector is very diversified, different banks for size and business model. Um, these banks most likely can be resolved using um, a mix of resolution tools. Uh, for example, using write-down and sale of business or sale of assets and liabilities. Um, this, in fact, has been the case for the uh, Banco Popular case and for the other cases that have been mentioned by uh, Irving, which um, are not resolution cases, but uh, indeed they are uh, cases of uh, restructuring through um, um, tools which uh, have, are alternative to, to resolution. Um, why am I uh, flagging this point about uh, the fact that Bailin will be used in conjunction with the other tools. Because this has an implication on the amount of MREL. Um, for banks that are not GSIBs or are not uh, OSIBs, just to add another acronym, other systemically important banks, uh, the fact that uh, sale of business can be, could be used could result as a feasible and credible option. Um, these uh, would have an implication on the amount of MREL, which will have to be set considering the fact that uh, the so-called recapitalization component of the MREL will not have to be met in its entirety. Um, this point has to be is linked with what Irving was saying, that the more the market within uh, Europe is integrated, the more likely uh, will be uh, the, the option of, of finding a purchaser. So this is a very important point that I want to, uh, to stress. And by saying that uh, uh, Bailin will be used in conjunction with other tools, and this might have an impact on the amount of required MREL, on the other hand, I want to be uh, clear that I'm not saying that in these cases where sale of business or other tools are credible, this would mean that MREL should be equal to capital requirements. This cannot be the case. Resolution cannot be a, a, a free lunch for uh, those who have invested in the bank. In, in the cases of uh, sale of business, uh, there will be a funding gap in the sale, and this has to be met with internal resources of the bank, be them equity or uh, liabilities. So the MRL should, in any case, be set considering this likely funding gap. The second point I want to touch on is on the to-do list. Um, I agree with the to-do list set out by Irving. Just let me uh, focus on two legal aspects. The first one is the lack of harmonization on uh, the concept of normal insolvency proceedings. Speak uh, about this would require um, probably an entire presentation, and I just cross-refer to what 
the chair of the SRB and the other board members have already flagged in, in previous in their speeches for regarding the need to harmonize at least minimum features of, of normal insolvency proceedings, which is the alternative to, to resolution, in order to facilitate resolution planning and resolution action. The second point about missing legal piece pieces is uh, an aspect on which I think uh, there has not been so far enough attention. And it is uh, the fact that cross-border banks, even within the banking union, they uh, live as a one single group, but if uh, things go bad, they die with separate legal entities. Um, this is due to the lack of a legal regime for cross-border groups where um, the, the groups are uh, addressed from a legal point, standpoint in the same way a bank with branches across uh, different uh, member states is treated. The lack of such a regime means that guarantees between the parent to the subsidiaries are subject to high uncertainties as regards uh, their enforceability in a crisis. This leads uh, host authorities uh, so what I'm saying is that even if managers of the parent wanted to give, to enforce, to execute this guarantee in a crisis case towards the subsidiary, they could be legally prevented uh, from doing so. So uh, this lack uh, of a legal uh, regime supporting uh, the, uh, this kind of arrangements uh, leads host authority to ask for full capitalization and fully fledged internal MREL levels so-called, it's a form of legal ring fencing. Um, so the point has to be addressed. Uh, I think um, the intra-group financial support was originally intended to, do, uh, to achieve this um, result, but unfortunately it missed the opportunity because during the negotiations, the home and the host authorities in the council asked for so many safeguards for the use of intra-group financial support so many that at the end of the day, no one has been using the intergroup financial support. It's not a feasible tool. Last but not least, uh, liquidity and resolution. Again, uh, the first part of this presentation, of, on this point, I will be very brief, also because we plan to have uh, an online seminar focused on this point in uh, most likely in January after uh, the December deadline where the Economic and Financial Committee in Europe will come forward with, with an answer. The problem, in a nutshell, is the fact that in the days after the resolution uh, the decision, there is a market failure. It's a, a, a problem of perception. The bank is well recapitalized. Nevertheless, the market doesn't believe so. So we need to build public facilities to allow banks that are recapitalized to access unsecured funding. And I'm stressing, the, and these uh, facilities have to be built with a predictable path. The clearer the use of these facilities for the market, the least the facility will be used because trust and proper market functioning will be restored. I stress the word access to unsecured funding because I think the word secure and collateral is a, is a, a matter on which there is a lot of disagreement in the, in the current public debate. Because we know that access to central bank uh, money is always accompanied by collateral, adequate collateral. And, and it's most likely that a bank on the Monday after resolution will not have collateral of the uh, best quality. Last point, and then I pass on, I'm eager to listen to the questions. The use of liquidity is important for a resolution authority from the resolution perspective also in the recovery stage, before the banks goes uh, belly up. Why? Because we don't know whether this liquidity is used to recover or actually is a use of liquidity uh, that is um, unsuccessful and so is use of liquidity in the run up to resolution. If resolution occurs notwithstanding the use of this liquidity in the recovery phase, this has an impact on the resolvability of the bank because use of liquidity in the recovery phase might amplify the magnitude of the loss and can result, would result, in lack of uh, high liquid uh, assets to post as collateral in resolution.
So this leads us uh, to the need for supervisory authorities and resolution authorities to discuss this ex ante in the resolution planning, recovery planning stage, and even more in the run-up to resolution. So I'm sure that in the meantime, uh, our participants will have had some, some time to uh, reflect on a few comments or questions. Uh, so you can, you can post them simply in the chat box which has appeared on screen. Um, Jan is right now publishing the results of the various questions. Uh, but maybe before, uh, while we wait for other types of questions from our participants, uh, who are still many with us today, um, perhaps I give the, the chance to, to Wilson to react to some of the points, perhaps briefly, two, two, three, two minutes uh, maximum, to the, the remarks made by Patrick and, and Stefano. Uh, thank you, and um, uh, thanks to both Stefano and Patrick for, I thought, very well-targeted comments. A couple of thoughts. Uh, first, um, to go to Stefano's uh, comments of Lender of Last Resort and the importance of distinguishing liquidity in the run-up to resolution and post-resolution. One of the things I think that is important about this, this is a point that was highlighted by Paul Tucker, that you have a bit of a moral hazard challenge for a central bank if they are lending to a solvent bank that continues to lose money. Um, so it's solvent when you start lender of last resort, continues to struggle, and now you're faced with a difficult problem of lending further to an insolvent bank. That presents the central bank, I think, with a very difficult spot. Uh, resolution is one of the things that can dramatically change that position. It can provide you with a mechanism to restore solvency, uh, to kick out the bad CEO that you were having to deal with, uh, and it gives you a very important toolkit. Uh, Tucker said that central bankers should be shouting from the rooftops about the revolution in lender of last resorts. Uh, but in what I would regard as sort of English understatement, he said, in practice, we do not observe any such shouting. Uh, second, second point, um, which Stefano also mentioned, um, uh, was secured support agreements, um, which is a mechanism, or support agreements more generally, as a mechanism to avoid what Mervyn King would describe as international in life but national in death. Uh, the U.S. has tried to build a mechanism here using collateralized agreements that works under U.S. bankruptcy law. Um, I know European law is more difficult. I do think that's an important thing to fix. There is, however, a solution that works without that. I think it, you can design a solution whereby you build a home host strategy that allocates, that retains flexibility uh, during the recovery phase and allocates equity and liquidity down to the point of failure. Uh, so you avoid the problem of distributing resources after failure. You have a modest amount of ring fencing ex ante. You top that up so that that modest amount, that minimum amount that each host country would require is present at all times. And that way I think you can, in a sense, beat the resolution clock uh, and restore a lot of flexibility compared to the full ring fencing case. So I think there are opportunities for Europe uh, to adopt something better. Uh, there's been a little progress in this dimension, but uh, still a lot of work to do. Last point to Patrick's sort of very big conceptual question, ec more equity versus TLAC. Uh, I do think there are some important issues here. I think. Um, if you just simply throw more equity at it, you run risks that European ROEs for European banks are already below the cost of equity. I think this, over time, will shrink the European bank sector. Uh, and the regulatory perimeter will shrink. Uh, the higher your equity demands and the higher your cost of your balance sheet is compared to other models. And I think particularly at a time when we're seeing a shift of bank models to more digital or fintech type competitors or other entities, um, that thinking of ways that you can accomplish the goals of resolution cost effectively, and TLAC, although it's expensive compared to other debt, is generally highly cost effective compared to equity, I think will give you a more stable system over time. I do think you need to make sure, to Patrick's point, that that's distributed to the right hands. If it's owned by a local voter, uh, a grandma who might have been sold the wrong instrument, that is not going to be politically tenable and stable. But if it's sold to well-diversified 
mutual funds, pension funds, proper credit investors, and if it's done in scale, I think you can avoid many of those problems and make it a more usable tool. Uh, I would invite you perhaps to write some some, uh, some recommendations of a, of a document in the in the chat box, and I would suggest that we ask uh, we address Ana Rita Garcia's question on the partial at least partial harmonization on national insolvency proceedings, um, where she asked, "Do you find this to be a credible solution? Meaning, do you think that member states will be willing to harmonize?" The insolvency proceeding, given the strong national specificities. So I think we talk here about political uh, feasibility uh, um, and political will again. Who wants to go with it, Stefano first, or? No, oh, I think that is a very difficult path, but uh, we are already on our way. We started with the BRD and we harmonized the ranking of depositors partially. Then we moved another step with the. Um, the following uh, commission piece of legislation introducing preferred and non-preferred uh, bonds. These are all interventions on uh, insolvency proceedings for banks. And so what was perceived to be in 2014, uh, the skepticism of Anarita uh, is progressively being overcome by, by the fact that we need this. We in my, in my slide, I speak about minimum harmonization, so we need to do a very surgical approach in order to, uh, to do it in a way where proportionality and subsidiarity is respected. So tailored to banks and tailored to the specific aspects which do make the okay, difference. Thanks. I could also uh, respond to Anna Rita's question. Um, the point of single point of entry resolution is to avoid this whole nest of questions. Uh, and this, this is one of the reasons I, I think that uh, a strong stack of subordinated MREL is important. Because if you're only doing bail-in and loss absorption at the top of a group, say, let, let's say that Europe evolves over time to have uh, several uh, continent-wide banking groups. If they issue sufficient MREL, you don't get to the point of national resolution. You're doing all your bail-in work at the top, uh, where you're going to have more uh, diversified investors, uh, where you're accessing more international capital markets. And I think you, in all the SPOE resolution strategies, you simply want to avoid that whole nest of questions underneath, where you have to deal with the pecking order within subsidiary in country A, country B, country C. I do think that's a, that's a useful thing to try and harmonize to the extent we can. I think it would make things better and smoother. Yes, just to flag that we have a so-called European specificity that even with a whole co-approach, you would have a whole co in different countries subject to different, uh, to different meaning of normal insolvency proceedings. And so this would make, in any case, no creditor worse off assessment, evaluation three assessment, dependent on the specificities of that normal insolvency proceedings. And we don't want to, to, to get there to a situation where there are so many differences and are so difficult to be understood. If you ask about these differences to local legal experts, they struggle sometimes to give the answer. So even in a whole core situation, you really need some degree of a harmonization in Europe on the concept of normal insolvency proceedings. Uh, on the internal uh, lack, I think I will pass on the, to the other speakers, but I think the FSB guidance is very clear and, and detailed on what, are, what is the purpose of internal uh, TLAC. Um, and the BRD2 will provide more, um, more clarity on, in, on internal MREL, uh, hopefully also addressing the ring fencing uh, uh, issue okay. through so uh, ask, uh, internal Patrick, MREL uh, answer. I think one of the points that arises in connection with this and, and the other questions is the, the goals of resolution. We, we've talked today about um, you know, taxpayer versus uh, creditor, and because that's the, the theme, it's paid in, but, but the goal of resolution is to preserve essential functions. And I think a lot of the discussion around um, around internal uh, allocations of TLAC uh, 
have to do with the different interests that arise in the failure situation as each national authority and each um, uh, political authority start to look at what they regard as essential functions and uh, whether there are enough resources available to them and under their control to preserve those essential functions in the jurisdictions for which they have responsibility. So I think it's very difficult to just to get away from uh, that by uh, by saying, oh, um, there should be harmonization across Europe. As long as there are multiple political jurisdictions in Europe, there will be multiple objectives. If, if I can respond, and uh, uh, I, I do accept that there are multiple political objectives. If you do single point of entry bail-in clean and right, uh, I do think you avoid even if you have holding companies in each country, and even if you have critical functions in each country, you avoid all of those questions. If you read back to the crisis, the worst top to bottom loss for GSIB was roughly 9% of RWA. Mm -hmm. If you can absorb that and recapitalize to a double digit capital standard, uh, at the top of the group, you can flow those resources down and avoid, I think, all those thorny legal and continuity questions. Um, Entirely. So, for so for me, the uh, the Gordian knot can be cut if you have sufficient MRO. Um, I would also like to respond to the internal TLAC question, uh, and here I disagree with my friend Stefano. I think the FSB has done an exceptional job on resolution broadly. I do not think they have yet come to grips with internal bank structure. It's the first time they've ever wrestled with that with internal TLAC. And I think they muffed that opportunity so far. Um, I think that we are now starting to get to grips with the need to provide homes with enough security through the use of internal TLAC prepositioned liquidity and equity. But designing the right structure that's both resilient and works in at the end in crunch time and works across borders, uh, I think is still in its infancy. So uh, I think there are solutions. Uh, we've tried to publish some here. Uh, happy to, to circulate that for folks who are interested. I would invite uh, the three speakers to uh, well come up with their close, closing comments and in that regard perhaps highlight if there are new certainties that uh, have come up in your mind thanks to the seminar or if you have new doubts and if yes on, on what. Um, perhaps Patrick, Stefano and, and the last word to, to Just, Wilson. Uh, come back on the question of single point of entry and I, I fully agree with Wilson that the single point of entry should be the correct and uh, an, an optimal solution. The problem is the lack of trust that makes downstream political entities fear that somehow they're going to be left alone and uh, lose out in this. And so the building of trust, in, hopefully in the process of a number of resolutions over the next five, ten years, should uh, ideally uh, bring, bring this problem uh, to, to some satisfactory solution itself. Yeah, from my side, I just want to thank the two speakers for uh, their very uh, thoughtful uh, remarks. And uh, I think that one cannot uh, underestimate uh, the importance of building MREL. Um, once MREL is built and banks uh, can stand on their own legs in case of uh, resolution, we will see more uh, predictability also in the application of the resolution uh, actions. Uh, these uh, first years where uh, um, Wilson was uh, spotting differences are also a consequence of a, a, a legacy situation where uh, failures has uh, occurred uh, in a transitional period where the BRD had been enacted but uh, once you uh, enact a law with a, with a signature on an official paper journal is different from, from enacting it in, uh, um, in its operational uh, aspects. So uh, I am confident that uh, MRL being built, we will see uh, in the coming years okay. much Thank more Wilson? predictability and Last homogeneity word. in the answer to failures. I would agree with Stefano's comments on the importance of the importance of the Emerald build. As, as I mentioned before, I do think that is the way to cut the Gordian knot, the difficulty of all of these other issues. Um, 
on the comment that Patrick just made on trust and home host, uh, perhaps I'm colored by my previous life on the trading floor uh, and as a chief risk officer. Um, I prefer to rely on incentives and good laws. Um, trust would be nice to have. I hope to have trust. But I do think we need to build the system on a foundation uh, that doesn't require a lot of practice to get right, that it, it is something where the incentives of homes and hosts can be aligned. Um, we've done some, some game theory work on how you build a home host system to do that. Uh, happy to share that uh, online with people who are interested. Thanks for watching. Uh, stay tuned with the Florence School of Banking and Finance.